Welcome to episode number five of um, What's Sex Got to Do With It? I'm here with Heather Remoff, my, my favorite great grandmother <laughs> in all of Massachusetts. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, Getting tell, more expansive. We get more then. expansive. We have another <laughs> yeah. layer to go, a few more layers to go. I'll, 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 I'll. You don't know that many great grandmothers. <laughs> Just so people don't think I'm your great grandmother. <laughs> Yeah, you adopted. I, I, I'd love to be adopted by you. Uh, so, so, uh, and, and so uh, chapter four is female choice and the origin of man, you know, and you're right, the reason for the title of that chapter? Uh, the reason for the title of that chapter is that I really believe that the way the female of the human species chose their partners is what has shaped us into the humans we are. And as one friend once said to me, well, Heather, how can you say we're a terrible species and also claim that women shaped us? I said, I'm not saying they did a great job of it, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that women selected men who would make sure that they, the female herself her children had a good chance of surviving. And by that selection process, the species that we are today has really been shaped. Now, as we mentioned in an earlier discussion, I'm convinced that the initial thing that started us down to the road was an end-to-end -end chromosome fusion. Right. But I think that fusion came with some drawbacks, as, as so many of those... Um, chromosomal um, non-disjunctions and so forth sometimes do come with drawbacks. And then in order to overcome them, women selected for certain traits that would ensure their survival, right. like skill with building shelter, so technological skills, uh, language ability, all of the things that, that make us human. And I think things that were very, very functional in the beginning, in the early stages, say 300,000 years ago, of our evolution may have become non-functional at this stage in that um, our control of resources is so excessive. We, are, we seem to be a species with insatiable desire and we're operating with a finite planet. We have infinite desires, and we're working with a finite planet. So, you know, in terms of climate change, that we have to learn to rise above some right. of our species-specific traits. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're. The, as I said, it's a little bit of a mystery, but you're giving it away. But that's okay. Oh, okay. You're, you're, you're hitting at it. You're yeah, yeah, at it. yeah. I'm, I'm just giving yes. teases. Yeah, just right. teases. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. And so, uh, apparently, you conducted a study. And you said the determination was a subjective one, largely based on a woman's assessment of a man's intelligent relative to her own. Mm -hmm. That's your study, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so I'm, I'm curious: did the women prefer the guys to be smarter than them, mm -hmm. or oh, so not just smart, but smarter than but they smarter were. Than they mm -hmm. were. Mm -hmm. That's Re interesting. Relative to their own intelligence. In fact, I didn't say in this book, but I've said elsewhere, particularly in discussions with my female friends that in terms of mating, it's most, if you picture two different hierarchies, a um, hierarchy of the available men and a hierarchy of the available females. The, the men at the bottom of the hierarchy have the most difficulty finding mates. And the women at the top of the female hierarchy have the most difficulty finding mates yeah. because they want men to be at least as smart as they are, at least as attractive as they are, all of those things. And that becomes more difficult for a woman at the top of the heap. And it's difficult for men at the bottom because uh, women are selecting up. Women tend to select up. So they want men to be at least as smart as they are, even better if they're smarter. And, 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 and That's so and interesting. All of those yeah, no, I, I get that. And it kind of fits anecdotally what. I, I've heard me, and especially me, because I spent a fair amount of time in academic 
circles, I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, what you say about, you know, women, you know, who are like at the top, I mean, they, they, they do have a hard time, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because I thought it might have been that the men were intimidated by them, but you're indicating that the women just aren't interested in someone that they consider and, and, and less I think, intelligent than they are. And I think it, your, your theory of intimidation, some of that may work too. Yeah. It may yeah. be an operation. I yeah. mean, it's a combination yeah, of things. It's yeah. a combination yeah. of things. But um, yeah, women, and again, this is all relative to them. Like a woman might decide a man was wealthy. That's compared to her own level of wealth. So it's it, the, the women's... Um, judgments of the men were subjective right, and yeah. I took their way of valuing men to be what I was after right, I was right, I was looking right, right. and I, I think I say somewhere in the book I don't remember if I say it in this chapter we may talk about it later if not uh, that the evolutionary directive to women appears to be when you can find the perfect man right. and when you can't invent him and it's when women are busy inventing men that we get ourselves in trouble. When we ascribe traits to a man that he doesn't actually have because we want him to have those traits and right. we haven't found the perfect man. So, so you said smarter. Where, where does like stronger, taller, and wealthier fit into your choices of men? I mean, so like smarter is like the top. I mean, do the others... I mean, how would the others rank? Did you consider that at all? And I'm more so what I'm trying to, I'm going to get at too, I'll ask one long question. Um, does wealth ever substitute in nicely for intelligence? Yes. I don't know nicely, but yeah. Well, you mean, but, well, well, do, well, not nicely, but we'll... we'll, we'll, we'll and, and wealth is a big attention yeah. getter. Yeah, does I that... I mean, it's a big, I tend not to like wealthy men. I'm uncomfortable with them. But nonetheless, signs of wealth will catch my attention. I mean, and... Does when, it imply intelligence? Huh? Does it imply intelligence? I don't think so, although oh, I, I did. I, I'm not as far as I'm concerned. Right. But as I told you, I have a bias against extremely wealthy men. I have a personal bias against them. Not at all related to evolution, I don't think. But I did hear, watch Bill Maher the other night and was stunned and shocked actually driven to screaming at the TV when he and his three guests all agreed that Jeff Bezos was the smartest man in the world. And I'm going, no, 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 he's the wealthiest man in the world. Right. And don't confuse wealth with intelligence. No, no, very different things. I, at one point I point out that's a mistake that Darwin made. I said, I, I, it was one of my favorite lines and I can't remember it, that, um, Conf confusing um, wealth with genetic superiority is a mistake made most often by those with great fortunes, as Darwin had. Right. And uh, watching those folks on Bill Maher nominate Jeff Bezos, uh, Jeff, um, no, not Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. Oh, Elon Musk. Oh, really? Elon Musk. I, I, was, I was like, oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, yeah, I had I, that wrong. Take oh, yeah. it back. Take yeah, it back. Uh, it was Elon Musk they were talking right, about, right, right. and uh, he is now the most well, the wealthiest man in the world, right? I think he's he's uh, he's number one now, and they all declared that he was the smartest man in the world. And I, uh, it just outraged me. I thought, no, 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 no. Yeah. Don't confuse the two. Yeah. They're not the same. Yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm gonna leave that one. Along. I'm not yeah. gonna, I'm not no, gonna, no, don't go there. I yeah, no, 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 I'm no. revealing my own <coughs> my own bias. No, no, no. I, mean, I, I certainly have my feelings. I mean, yeah. about the 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 person that we've mentioned, Ian, and, and I'm just gonna. gonna no, leave, no. I'm gonna leave it there for now. <laughs> Cause, cause, but yeah. in the, to answer your question, yeah. I don't consider wealth and intelligence yeah. to be be uh, correspond good. There, I don't think there's necessarily a strong correlation between the two. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. This is, um, as I'm kind of scrolling through my notes here, it's like, this is an interesting chapter. I'm going to keep this to the amount of time that we have. Because uh, uh, we do talk about inheritance of acquired characteristics. I want to come back to that very shortly. But we, you, you talked earlier about rational thinking is selected for only as long as it doesn't interfere with the push towards procreation. 
do you see when something to you is irrational, is it also illogical? I, I, I don't know how to answer that okay. question. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think we're rational actors. I think language, which, you know, to me, that's the heart of our of human exceptionalism is yeah. based in, lang in our language mm -hmm. ability. And I don't think um, I, one thing that language enables us to do is to lie. Yeah. And we're very good at lying to right. ourselves and convincing ourselves that what we believe is true. So we're much better at rationalizing right. than we are at rational thinking as a species. We're really good at rationalization. Okay, so then when something is irrational to you, what does that mean? I, uh, me personally? Yeah, you personally. Or if, yeah. Or, or, or. or you see, I'm trying to tease out what people really mean by irrational, you know? Um, I, what, I think what people mean is that they're not thinking clearly. And what, to me, rationalization works better for me than to say someone's irrational. I know that we're just very, very good at justifying our own behavior, right, right. at convincing ourselves that we're right, right, that we're doing something for the general good that really benefits us right. personally. To me, that's rationalization. Right. Uh, to, so to go back to your original question, logic I view as something a little bit different. Yet, you know, it's it's certain steps you take. If right. this is A is true, then B is right, you know right, that right, kind right. of thing. That's logical thinking, and in a way, those systems of logic protect us. Right from the kind of rationalization that we fall prey to. Right. I often say that the scientific method um, was designed to keep us honest yeah. because we're so good at kidding ourselves. What I sometimes find too is that I mean, when people say something is rational, I mean, they then say it can't possibly be logical. I mean, and so they dismiss trying to figure out why it is irrational. Because I think for people it's like, if you come to the wrong conclusion, then of course it could have been logical, you know. And for me, it's like no, you can come to the wrong conclusion. It's just you need to figure out where the failure, I mean, in the logic happened, mm -hmm. I mean, and either it is in the wrong premises, which is essentially the conclusion about the premises, yeah. or it's in the conclusion that you make on the correct premises, yeah. you know. Uh, and so, so, uh, so I was just kind of teasing out what you meant by yeah. Yeah. irrational, just to try to maybe test what I feel about I me. Mean, rational still has a logic to it. You just need to figure out what that logic is. Or let me rephrase that. Irrational has a logic to it. You just need to figure out what that is. And it can have know. a reproductive logic to it. Yeah. To get back to evolution. Yeah. It, we, we can be very irrational. Yeah. And, and it can serve the purpose. Right. As I've said, the human brain was shaped by evolution yeah. to be really good at two things. Right. Reproduction and survival, yeah, and but, it can be not so great at a whole bunch of yeah. other stuff. Yeah, here's an example of the interviewee keeping the interviewer on topic. So thanks for <laughs> bringing me back to the whole reason that that we're here, and I'm going to go back to the topic that and I said I get back to, and that is um, inheritance of acquired characteristics. Yeah, that's an interesting one and, uh, 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 in, in epigenetics. I mean, I think you make a really good case be for. Uh, epigenetics mean and its role in almost be like a substitute for inheritance of acquired characteristic you know because as you point out in order for for people to consider uh in a characteristic to stick it would have to stick for over four generations because mm -hmm. you know, that would take care of all the effects mm -hmm. of the reproductive elements right. during the exposure that has created the epigenetic response you know and and so on. So it's, it's to me, I, I almost see epigenetic responses as the acquired, the inherited acquired characteristic or the characteristic I mean, uh, that, you know, how did I phrase this, you know? Would inheritance of acquired, well, no, it's going to be a thing. Oh, I didn't write the question down. All right. You know, uh, but I, I thought about, let's see if I remember the conclusion I came to that, that the epigenetics the, or the ability to um, have an epigenetic response was itself the 
acquired characteristic that's inherited. You know? So the fact that we have that, I mean, and it can allow for, I mean, essentially the species to capture a trait that it wants if it I mean, persists long enough. Because what you said is that, well, if it is beneficial I mean, for you to have this trait, the species have this trait, you essentially have four generations. In, in, in terms, and, and get it. you I mean, know, all uh, my, I'm really summarizing a really brilliant lecture I yeah. heard at the Radcliffe Institute. Yeah. Um, I forget her name, Karen Michaels, something of that nature. And she really explained in ways that were over the yeah. heads of, I think, most of us in the audience, but she explained it in such a way that we could know it, but not, not, Right. not explain it to someone else. Sort of the molecular reactions right. that triggered epigen the epigenetic uh, changes. Right. And she convinced me that they only last for three or four generations, right. Right. depending on whether or not the woman, for example, they're right. talking about extreme hunger during right. the Holocaust, the, the standard example in which people right. say, oh, well, that demonstrates um, the inheritance of acquired characteristics, and she says, not so fast. Right. It really, it's, this is epigenetic inheritance, isn't right. really permanently acquired characteristics. Right. And she explained the mo at the molecular level right. what's happening to cause those changes. And the examples that are most often um, cited are children of the Holocaust, where their parents were starving, tend to gain weight. Right. Very easily in subsequent generations, yeah. like they've, it's almost like they're pre-adapted to right. a scarcity of food, right. and then when they're in an environment where there's suddenly there's plenty of food, right. they gain weight, and people claim that as an example of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And this researcher right. said, no, this is limited over time. Right, right, right. But that if you really did need to have that characteristic, it would be, stay if the conditions, if the scarcity. My my, right. uh, what I kind of push on to that right. is if the scarcity was permanent, right. then there'd be time to select for, for that trait right. in a way that would make it an, a, right. a, a, a permanent uh, fixture. And given how fast we, we can evolve when we select for a trait, right. there'd right. be a way. Yeah. And so I had actually written the question later on. <laughs> and so I said, epigenetic change is the acquired inherited characteristic, you know, uh, uh, and, and I know that's more poetic I mean, than accurate, but it's almost like, well, yeah, the, we don't have the genetic mechanism to allow for inherited, inheritance of acquired characteristics, mm -hmm. but, but the fact that we can experience epigenetic change mm -hmm. I mean, is essentially the... A, the, a way to go. And yeah. of course, at, at one point, Darwin was very... Darwin had everything in his theory. I mean, you can pick and choose. But he himself said, as with any theory, not everything is going to be correct. With further studies, some of the points I'm making may be proven to be wrong. I give him a lot of credit for saying that. Uh, but he, you know, uh, the evolution of acquired uh, characteristics was very much in his... Uh, in his uh, theory of, of human evolution and evolution in general, that acquired characteristics would be inherited. Darwin, yeah. that, that's, in, that's in his book. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's, so, that's in, it, it's kind of interesting that it's not there. I mean, I mean, it's just, it makes me wonder, I mean, what would be the genetic mechanism that would allow it to happen and why isn't that mechanism there? You know, and well, in a sense, as, as the researcher, the epigenetic researcher that I heard speak, in certain circumstances it can happen. I mean, you know, there can be epigenetic inheritance that causes changes that are adaptive for the species experiencing them and whether or not they become permanent de really depends on whether the condition that inspired that initial epigenetic change becomes permanent, gives you time to do do the other selecting. That's my take on it. Yeah, and, and I, who, some, I may be proven wrong tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, some people are listening to this right now. And they say, uh, 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 she's got that wrong. Right, right. Well, I mean, I understand part of the mechanism is just that. I mean, in, depending on the species, I mean, the eggs being are being produced early on, and they're kind of protected. I mean, from for what's going on I mean, um, in the rest of the organism to a certain extent. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean stress I mean, can have the epigenetic change, I mean, but I mean, uh, 
Uh, if you be, I was about to say, if you become, if you become a really fast runner, be, that won't work either because I mean a fast runner is genetically be, a fast runner. You know? So I am, I'm going to need to get myself out of this <laughs> train of thought into <laughs> <Okay. laughs> something else because cause we, I, I can't. Oh, epigenetics is complicated yeah. and discussions of it are complicated and fun. Yeah. I mean, it, it, because it's not fully understood. And that to me is what I, I love things that are not fully understood right. because they're kind of a mystery that I want to yeah. solve and get figured out. Right. And, and that's what we're working with here. Yeah, and I guess that's, I'll... All right. And it depends on what we call a characteristic too. So the, the the I was getting caught up in things that are really genetic. But let's say me you uh, you experience a traumatic episode that results in the loss of a limb or something. Mm -hmm. Well, me that's not going to be passed on. Me, no. But nor should it. Me. But then again, is that a characteristic? Yeah. It's not really. No. It's just a description no. of something oh, that's something happened. happened to you. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it, um, well, you know. I think I'm going to leave it at that, you know, for this chapter. I mean, a lot of it had to do uh, with epigenetics. I mean, but, but as I mentioned other t in, in other episodes, I mean, yeah, other episodes, other chapters, every chapter actually, you know, there's just lots of interesting um, stories, you know. One of, the things, yeah. one of the things I had fun with, I think, in this chapter is Darwin's own courtship with his the woman he married, his cousin, Emma Darwin. Yeah. And uh, he, he went through a list of traits, the pros and cons of getting married. And one of his, his reasons for getting married, well, in terms of its companionship and better than a dog anyhow. And I think it was in this chapter that I made the crack. If, if that had been Emma Darwin's criterion for choosing a partner, she would have gotten herself a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel um, that women would select much more intensely than Darwin was doing. And of course, he didn't believe that civilized women were any longer intelligent enough to make choices. And I had a bit of fun with that. I said, um, his system of getting choices, making choices, is an example of civilized mate selection. I didn't think so. But because Darwin was such a misogynist, I, you know, I, I sometimes get impatient with his assumptions about female behavior. Yeah, well, it's what we should, huh? You know, uh, so, so yeah, uh, so, well, you know, it's perhaps not the the happiest note to end the chapter on. <laughs> but, but it's a note we can have fun with. I yeah, mean, yeah. people make. I mean, it's fun to tease about those things, right? Yeah, I yeah. hear it. You know, yeah. and, 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 and I'm fine with that. You know, um, and and sometimes my endings are going to be smooth, and sometimes they're not. So, so, smooth enough. Yeah, right? smooth enough. <laughs> and, and I'll just I'll just tease people with that next episode. It's going to be chapter five, and it's the difference that makes. A difference. Uh -huh. mean, and I like this chapter. I yeah. do too. I do too. And, and, and so, yeah, I'm going to have fun with that one. And, and, and so, so consider yourself teased, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. <laughs>